Uh, kia ora, um, I'm Rawiri Keenan, Pau for the for the college and we're at the conference this year, GP18 in, in Auckland and I'm really humbled and lucky to be speaking to um, Kamara Jones who's just given us an a, amazing keynote speak to kick off our, our, our conference and um, so thank you Kamara and, and welcome. Oh thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. Um, it's really, I've got a, we had a few questions that we set off we'd talk about, but it's okay. um, really hard to know where to start because you gave such an amazing, amazing talk. Well, let me talk about my um, feelings coming yeah, to, to give I'd, that I'd talk. I'd love to start there. Because, um, well, first of all, this is not my first time in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I was here 19 years ago for eight months when I was an Ian Axford fellow at the Ministry of Health in the Māori Health Branch, Te Ke Te Haora, which mm. doesn't exist anymore. And when I learned that, I was yes. a bit troubled anyway. Yeah. But so it means that I had eight months to really get a sense of the situation 19 years ago. And when I came, my project was entitled Māori Pākehā Health Disparities Can Treaty Settlements Reverse the Impacts of Racism? Okay. So even in that time, I had sort of three main things I was doing. The first was um, speaking around New Zealand about racism, using some of my definitions of racism that I shared today and mm -hmm. my gardener's tale I even shared 19 years ago mm -hmm. to see whether that had any resonance at all for people here in Aotearoa. And it's interesting because at that time, people tell me that for about the past eight or 10 years, they had stopped using the word racism at all. And they were more talking about ethnicity and all, and they were very happy that I sort of gave people permission to start naming racism again with my mm. story. Mm. The second part of my work, besides going and talking around the country, was to study, um, you know, the Waitangi Tribunal. So first to study the treaty and the history, and then I sat in some some of the hearings at the Waitangi Tribunal, and then I went and tried to understand some of the work of, you know, the Office of Treaty Settlements and I was at Te Puni Kokuri, you know, TPK and so I was getting a whole deep understanding of treaty settlements. And then I also did some research. I did, looked at, um, I can't even remember the, the name of the periodic survey now, the New Zealand yeah. Health, Health Survey. survey. Yes. yes. And so I was looking at that and I was trying to see if what I had noticed in the United States between black and white people in terms of an accelerated aging of mm -hmm. black folks compared to white folks in terms of blood pressure distributions. I looked at that for Maori Pakia and I found instead of a 10 year accelerated aging between black folks and white folks, about a five year accelerated aging here. So, that, so I did those three things. And to answer the question that I came to answer, Maori Pakia health disparities, can treaty settlements reverse the impacts of racism? My answer was twofold. It was really maybe that that certainly the, the recognition to, to recognize and rectify historical injustices is key mm. to achieving health equity. But if you just did that, if you just did, say, treaty settlements that involved returning of land or some kind of money or, you know, something like that without an ongoing partnership, without an ongoing honoring of the partnership between Maori and the Crown, mm. then even if you evened, you know, I told this story today about yes. the garden, so even if you enriched the poor rocky soil today until it was as rich as the rich fertile soil, if the gardener continues to prefer red over pink, the gardener will continue to privilege red over pink or going forward. So you need to affect something about the gardener. Mm. So um, that, was, uh, that was what I thought then. I'm only here for a few days. I, don't have a chance to really assess where things have happened, you know, where they've gone in 19 years. Mm. But, um, but I'm pretty sure that this is not a post-racial society yet. I think it's important, you know, a lot of times you say the word racism, and at least in the United States, people think, oh, you're calling me racist, mm -hmm. right? And so when I talk about racism, I'm really clear that I talk about it as a system that it's not an individual character flaw, it's not a personal moral failing, yeah, it's not that. even a psychiatric illness. So I talked about that and what it really is, is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning mm. value based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, mm. that has three impacts. It unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. When I talk about racism in that way, then it gets us past the um, the thought that 
I'm trying to divide the room into who's racist and who's not. I'm not in that business at all. Yeah. Do you think that um, plays the role of individuals in any way uh, in, uh, in fixing the problem? So, that, so, that, so it's, okay. it's the government's problem. The government's no, the garden no, and not me? No. Okay. Oh, that's a very interesting question. So no. So people, I would say it this way. Sometimes when you think about the system or when I do, I think it, it's like you had a cement factory mm -hmm. that's spewing cement dust and everybody around that cement factory for even just a little bit of time is going to have cement dust in their lungs. Right. So the first job is to say there is a cement factory spewing cement dust and it's affecting all of us. Mm -hmm. Then if you don't want cement dust in your lungs, you have to put on you know, a, a filter, you know, a gas mask. Mm -hmm. But that's not good enough to say, oh, okay, now I'm okay, I have a gas mask. No, you need to tell other people, you need to name racism, name the fact of that factory. cement factory, right. get other people to put the gas mask on, and then what you're doing is all of you are gonna go into the factory and shut it down. Right. So, yes, people have cement dust in their lungs. I'm not saying that when I talk about the cement factory, I'm saying you don't have cement dust in your lungs. And actually it affects some of us differently. Mm -hmm. So the people who are benefiting from the cement factory might want a little cement dust. They don't mind because they're making money or whatever. People have different relationships to the cement factory. Right. But in fact, that cement dust is sapping the strength of the whole society. Right. right? And so we, we all need to name it. We need to figure out what to do. We, we can do our individual stuff, yes. But then we need to have a systemic approach. It's not even going to be enough for a lot of people to walk around with gas masks on. That yeah. is not the answer. So individuals certainly have a role. Individuals are part of how racism does play out. Institutions work through individuals and individuals' actions are condoned by institutions. So even though I make a distinction between institutionalized yes. and personally mediated racism, they're not separate mm. entirely, right? So there's a relationship there. But what I'm saying is, at least at this point of where we are, it's not enough to say you have cement dust in your lung and pretend like I don't, yes. right? We're all being affected by the system in different yeah. ways. And the only way, instead of talking about who has cement dust and who has more and who has less, is to talk about the factory yeah. and shut it down. Yeah. So that's why I'm focusing right now on the system. Yes. Okay. So, so that it's not enough for us as individual doctors or individual practices to acknowledge that there's inequities, acknowledge that there's racism. We have to, maybe act. through the college, band together to act. Absolutely. Otherwise, where that, that overwhelming feeling of not achieving anything is sapping us as much as it's sapping those and, people. And so sometimes we feel, what can I do as an individual practitioner, mm. Mm. right? Well, what you can do as an individual practitioner is to honor your patients. You can try to link them up with stuff. You can to name, acknowledge these things. But we don't have to think about just our individual efficacy. We can think about collective efficacy mm. and because everybody here at this meeting and everybody listening to this conversation is probably going to be related in some way to the college, to use the college to set agendas, to use the college as a collective voice is very important. To storm that cement factory together. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and to prioritize it, you know, because yeah. there are many things that can be um, on an agenda. Actually, I didn't get a chance during my keynote to talk mm. about how is racism operating here. So let me just say that the way that racism operates is through structures, policies, practices, norms and values, which are actually elements of decision making. Structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making, especially who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. And whenever anybody finds themselves at a decision making table, they should look around and say, who is not here who has an interest in this proceeding? And then not just represent those interests, but find that person away to the table. So if structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making, policies are the written how of decision making, practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision making, and values are the why. So the college is in a very important place, even in terms of who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. And then in terms of developing policy that could be useful. I mean, there's so many ways that this collective could be useful in the struggle. Mm. That's great. I think it's, I think it's important because it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, easy to name, or well, it's getting easier to name. I think yes. everybody here who heard your talk maybe feels a bit more comfortable to name, right. but I think it's um, useful. There's some interaction with a useful analogy for 
what we as individuals, you know. And the, and the understanding how is racism operating here, that mm. it's not a cloud, it's not a miasma that we can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable mm. mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, and norms and values, which are the elements of decision making. That decision making is power. Yeah. Decision making is the power. You know, we talk about racism as a system of power. That's it's in the decision making. Okay. That's great. Thank you. One one of the other things that is starting to come up here a bit more, I think, as we're getting more comfortable saying the word racism, is this thing of is unconscious bias a polite way of saying racism, or are they different? So. Unconscious bias is, you know, I talked about three levels of racism, institutionalized, yeah. personally mediated, and internalized. Un unconscious bias or implicit bias is part of that personally mediated stuff. That's what most people think of when they hear, mm. hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. And the unconscious bias is all part in that. It's part of the prejudice mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, I think that when people say unconscious bias or implicit bias, it isn't a way of not saying racism. Um, it's good to talk about implicit bias or unconscious bias, but then people also say, go into this thing, well, we, everybody has implicit bias. That's true. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be prejudiced or even discriminate. That's true. So we have to talk about racism because racism is not the same thing. That's part of how racism gets acts through people. Mm -hmm. But racism is the system. The system. And so, yes, anybody can have implicit or unconscious biases, anybody can have a prejudice, anybody mm. can even discriminate if they're in a position of power. Some people can't discriminate because they're not even in that little tiny position of power. But racism is the whole system yeah. of the, power. It's a difference. system of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. Yeah. That is what we need to deal with. So to recognize your unconscious bias is important. That's what an individual can do against the racism against the facts racism. And, of the, and, and the system. To recognize um, that they might be having a role that they didn't understand in the system. Mm -hmm. You know, I told the story about the two-sided sign, yes. the open-close sign, and the story I call yes. restaurant, uh, yeah. dual reality, a restaurant saga. I think the unconscious bias is one part of it, but there's also the lack of understanding that racism exists. Right. So unconscious bias is one thing, not understanding that there is a system that structures opportunity in a two-sided way, not understanding that you are sitting inside a restaurant eating, the, door, the sign says open and you think everybody can come in. That lack of understanding is fatal. So that's again not understanding that we're dealing with a system that is creating a two-sided or multi-sided reality in the society. So it's okay in your unconscious bias to say, oh, I know I would prefer if these kind of people didn't come in the restaurant. That's, but the bigger thing is to understand that there's a sign that the reason you don't see people in the restaurant is because there's something structural going on. Yeah. And that you, what we need to train ourselves to do, I sort of say using black holes, we need to train ourselves to ask, is there a two-sided sign going on here? We need to train ourselves to ask, is this cliff three-dimensional and where am I? At what part of the cliff am I operating? We need to train ourselves to ask, is there a difference in the quality of the soil? We need to make our flower boxes transparent. We need to start looking, we need to ask ourselves, am I inactive in the face of need? Because inaction in the face of need is a huge way that institutionalized racism manifests. So we need to ask ourselves who's not at the table who has an interest in this proceeding. What's not on the agenda? We have to get used to seeing the absence of. There's a power in seeing the absence of. Mm. Mm. And we need to develop that discipline. Yeah, that's great. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a common discussion, or becoming more common here as the discussion gets more put out there and I, I guess it's that um, confusion maybe between individuals and system so that yes. the, the system doesn't have unconscious bias the system is racist it, yes but individuals uh -huh. can 
can you know still have unconscious inspire. and conscious bias. Yes, yes. They can have yeah. unconscious and conscious bias. bias, and they can act on it or not act on yes. either one. Yeah. So I mean, there's all of that going yep. on. Yeah. Right. So you. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think great. I think it's a nice, clear, yeah, you know, separate of the the two terms, which are right. which I think well here anyway maybe seem to get used interchangeably right. with sort of. But I think that, that clarifies it. Let me just say, so I don't know if this applies here in New Zealand, mm. but in the United States, um, it's a society that has widespread denial that racism continues to exist mm -hmm. at all or have profound impacts on the health and well-being of the nation. In the context of that widespread denial, if we don't say the word racism, we're complicit with that denial. So it is important to talk about implicit or unconscious bias, about disparities, disproportionalities, inequities, diversity and inclusion, you know, mm. cultural competence. Those are all important things. Race, ethnicity, those are important things to talk about. But if we never say the word racism, you know, we could talk about race, but we have to get the whole ism out. So yeah. if we never say racism, you know, we could do that. We can practice racism, race, okay, racism, race. And now, oh, it comes out more easily. If we never say the word racism, in the context of widespread denial, we are complicit with that denial. Yeah. So we have to talk yeah, about racism, different. even as we talk about the other things. Mm. Otherwise, we're complicit with the denial of racism. Okay. And do you think we maybe don't do that? You sort of mentioned sort of, so I can't remember the term you use, but a term I've used is sort of the, the white fragility or sort of oh, being careful of feelings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I talk about white comfort, right? White comfort, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 white comfort. Do you think that's why we don't say it, or is it because of those um, so I don't know why people don't say it here. Yeah. I haven't been here again yep. long enough. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think it's so much Maori people or Pacifica people or people of color, you know, worried about white fragility. Mm. No, I think it's white people perhaps being so fragile that if you start the conversation, they run. Mm. or they shut it down or they label you oh that one has a chip on their shoulder and then they start tuning you out whatever you say or uh, you, that right. it's a fear of losing your effectiveness so not that I for example would be afraid of raising the issue because I might hurt your feelings it's just that the whole system is protecting yeah. itself from that conversation in in ways of power and I think you touched on it in your in your speech I think it's maybe related to that history and not understanding where how the soil Got, got the way separated. it is, right? Yes, that's and right. If, if and how the sea got separated and all of that. Yeah. That's true. And to the extent that we don't, so New Zealand, I think, is a bit ahead of the U.S. in terms of acknowledging full history. So at mm -hmm. least, you know, now um, there's an acknowledgement that the uh, the Treaty of Waitangi was a real thing and mm -hmm. it is to be honored. There was, I guess, since 1976, uh, you know, the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal. I may have my dates wrong or whatever, yeah. but in the 1988 or so, you know, the mm -hmm. whole treaty settlement process started and all of that. And so at least there is an acknowledgement of that history. In the U.S., with regard to American Indians, Native Americans, many people act as if they no longer exist. Right. You know, there's like, like, oh, are they still around? Because they represent 1% of our population. Mm. And then in terms of people of African descent, which now represent about 11% of the population, there's never been any acknowledgement of wrong in the enslavement of people, no kind of apology. No, in, if you say the word reparations, people are like, oh no, they're going to come take my stuff. I mean, this, this, is, this is the system is tamping down these kinds of discussions mm. because they're afraid of making things right. Yeah. What it's going to cost them psychically, what it might cost them in terms of opportunities to get their kids in school versus other people's in schools or even money. So there's a big fear there. Fear there. But I want to say this, I didn't yet share my definition of health equity. So I'd like to do it while I'd in this to. conversation, yes. right? So I have a three-part definition of health equity, which is, so it's different from the Royal College, New Zealand College of General Practitioner definition, which I saw. Um, and it's we might need to change ours. <laughs> it would be great if you took this one. Okay, see what you think. Okay. See what you think. So it's three parts. What is health equity? How do we get there? And how is it related to health disparities? I say health equity is assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. So it's assurance, which is a, a, a group function, you would say maybe a government function, or at least some kind of collective function, assurance. So it's not, I think your definition starts with the uh, opportunity 
for individuals to have the opportunity and something, something. To attain. To attain. Yeah, yeah. But it's about individuals. Yeah. It's mm. framed from the individual. It's not mm. framed from a responsibility of any collective. Right. So, and even the Healthy People 2020 definition in the United States, to which I contributed, but then I sort of elaborated this one beyond that. That one says that health equity is attainment of the highest level of health for all people. That's still an outcome. I don't think health equity is an outcome. We want attainment of the highest level of health for all people. We want your definition. But how do we get there? And if we hit it last Sunday, are we done? Right. No. No. So I say that health equity is a process. Which process? Assurance. Assurance of what? Of the conditions for optimal health, which some people would describe as the social determinants of health. For whom? For all people. That's what makes it equity. So if health equity is assurance of the conditions for optimal health, for all people, how do we get there? Achieving health equity requires at least three things. Valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. Not equally, but according to need. How is health equity related to health disparities? Health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. So health disparities are the differences in outcomes. Health equity is all that that comes before. And I think I hear you all in this country using health equity the way we use, or health inequities the way we use health disparities, still referring to the outcomes. Mm. And so I make this distinction that health equity is all that about the conditions and stuff that came before. And it's something that can be assured. We don't have to wait for an outcome. We can, in fact, we can invest in opportunity. And we might have to invest in opportunity for a generation for 20 years before we'll really see huge outcomes, differences in outcomes. Right. So, so even that framing of what health equity is, it's not the outcome, it's all the stuff that came before, tells us, it directs us in a different way of how we're going to try to achieve health equity. Mm. It's going to be about investment in outcomes and, and investment in societal valuation. I guess that's sort of like dealing with white supremacist ideology in the U.S. context, which is, oh my God, they're, they're out of their closets, yeah. you know? Dealing with all of that differential uh, assumptions about people's abilities and intrinsic worth, which is manifest in countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot, a, a, lot, lot. There's a, a lot, lot there, I isn't there? Talking, I can keep talking forever, I, I want keep, to take a I breath. I can keep listening, but you take <laughs> a breath, <laughs> because I think, yeah. No, it's, um, no, I think, yeah, we, have largely moved on. We still do have pockets of sort of, you know, it's genetic as to why uh -huh. Māori are, are representative here mm. or, or not, you know, we've mm. largely moved on, but it, it's, it's still there. Um, but I, I really, I, mean, I, think, I, I think I hear your difference between social determinants of equity and social determinants of health. Um, do you want me to but, talk about that a little but, bit? Yeah, I, just wonder, I mean, I think, I think it's a good, I think it's a useful point to okay. clarify, because if, if I'm hearing you right, it, it's, measuring health equity is actually none of the health things at all, or at least it's oh, a... Oh, okay. So uh, there are two distinctions that I've just made. So one um, is the difference between health disparities, the outcomes, and health equity, the conditions that came before. Okay. But then there's also uh, a difference between the social determinants of health and the social determinants of equity. So I talked about that a little bit with my three-dimensional mm -hmm. cliff. Well, at first, you could talk about social determinants of health if you just see somebody walking and falling off the cliff of good health, and you imagine there might be an ambulance there, maybe there's a net to catch people before they get crunched at the bottom, maybe there's a fence to keep them from falling. But what if everybody's pushed up against the fence? Addressing the social determinants of health is moving people away from the edge of the cliff. And so that includes addressing the context of their lives, addressing poverty, average neighborhood conditions, and the like. You can't even address the social determinants of equity until you understand that you're not dealing with a flat two-dimensional cliff, you're actually dealing with a three-dimensional cliff. And on that three-dimensional cliff, maybe there's an ambulance at the bottom but the slower goes off in the wrong direction, or maybe there's no ambulance, maybe there's no net, no fence. Usually at those parts of the cliff, the population is being pushed closer to the edge. Now that you understand you're dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, that's when you can ask, first of all, why are there differences in how resources are distributed along the cliff? And why are the differences in which populations are found at different parts of the cliff? And when you start asking those questions, now you're addressing the social determinants of equity, which are systems of power that can distribute resources and populations. So you're going from addressing poverty and adverse neighborhood conditions to now addressing racism, sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, and the like. 
And as a real example of what it means, addressing the social determinants of health might be, in the U.S. context, maybe we'll have, a, you know, a, uh, we'll plant neighborhood gardens, or maybe we'll have a farmer's market, or maybe we'll put in a bike path, or maybe we'll beautify this park, right, to, to make the conditions in the neighborhood better. Addressing the social determinants of equity is who is at the table deciding what we're going to do and in which neighborhood, in which neighborhood when. And, yeah. So the, the, the social determinants of equity, those mechanisms are what I was talking about before in their structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. Who's at the table, who's not? What's on the agenda, what's not? All of those mechanisms are mechanisms of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and the like. It's two different things. Mm. One is programs and projects. The other is who's deciding. Yeah. So one is about the decision and the content of the decision. The other is who's deciding when and where and how. Mm. And we have to address all of that. If I could just say one more thing about the cliff, most of the people in the college are working somewhere on the edge of the cliff. They might be in the ambulance, maybe they're trying to be a strong net, maybe they're trying to be a strong fence, or maybe they're at different times or for different patients, all of that. Mm -hmm. right? I'd agree. And that's important. So we need work at all of those levels. We need fast and fair ambulances. Right? We need strong nets, we need strong fences, we need to be moving the population, and we need to be acknowledging and addressing the three-dimensionality of the cliff. Recognizing that folks, members of the college, are working along the cliff edge, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing they can do. So that's, if that's their day job, we need them to do great stuff there at their day job. But as citizens, they can be addressing, especially I would say, the three-dimensionality of the cliff. So it's to figure out what can you do outside of your day job or even as part of your day job, but especially outside of your day job, to address these other levels of health intervention. Excellent. You're not stuck just because you're trying to be the best ambulance driver in the world. We, I want you there. Mm. When I show up in a hospital or an emergency department, I need you to be the best there. But I also, you need to be wondering, is there a net above me? And if so, how strong is that net? You need to wonder, is there a fence? And how strong is that fence? You need to wonder, how close is the population to the edge? And then you really need to, need to wonder, where am I operating along this three-dimensional cliff? So you have to have an awareness of all of the different levels, no matter where you find your day job. That's, that's great. Have you had enough? I don't know. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> I did have one other, one other question sure. around... Um, you've been doing this for a long time, oh. and the, the, like you mentioned, 19 years ago you came to New Zealand, and I've you know, definitely seen talks and papers from you over the last 10 years. Are we getting anywhere? Um, or is it? It's a multi generational effort. So, in the United States, we're getting somewhere in that I and many others are making it easier for people to name racism. There's a lot of research now on the impacts of racism on health. Mm. The next stage, so, so some, now I'm doing talks that I call race, racism, and anti-racism. Mm -hmm. So we've gone beyond just measuring disparities by race or ethnicity. That's good. And we're now talking about racism as a root cause mm. of those racial disparities. And so we have measures of racism and we're you know, looking at the impacts of racism on health and well-being, not just of the so-called disadvantaged people, but we should also look at the impacts of racism on the health of advantaged people and on how it saps the strength of the whole society. That's a very important, yeah. I think that's, the, that's really where our work on the impacts of racism has to be is how is it sapping the strength of the whole society so that we develop a sense of urgency in the whole community to mm. dismantle the system. Mm. But then beyond race, now racism, we need to go to anti-racism to develop a science and practice of anti-racism which can not only uh, organize people on things, but to develop a, to be able to do some anticipatory action against what happened in the United States after President Barack Obama was the president for two terms, and now we've got mm. a different so administration. Like when things are undone, or that that pendulum swing to anticipate and prepare for those kinds of things, mm. to recognize that our efforts will have counter efforts. Mm. And if we develop a science and practice of anti-racism, we'll also be aware of those counter efforts and be able to prepare ourselves for that. In my life, I have wanted to be able to equip people to have a conversation on racism. I say a national conversation on racism in the US. Thinking that my children's generation would then be able to 
engage in a national campaign against racism. And then probably in their generation, they will be putting in place new systems, a new structure, right. so that everybody can know their full potential and have the ability to develop to their full potential. So I think it's a many generational thing. And I think in my generation, we started, at least started the naming. It's some hope moving forward, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, can I pick your brain around one more sure. topic? Sure. Uh, we, we look, we have GPs and, and doctors have to do audits of practice, okay. audits of their medical practice each year. And there's requirements around that and it's essentially you know, a condition and how you're doing against guidelines or mm. sort of monitoring and that mm. kind of thing. And I, I had a discussion recently around whether or not looking at outcomes by ethnicity effectively, Māori versus non-Māori. We're, we're talking individual doctors with you know, 20 or 30 patients at most, so these are not epidemiological studies, but I had this discussion with some extent that if we start looking at outcomes by ethnicity, then we are moving into epidemiological studies and they're not audits and that we should be diving deeper. But Oh, so. well, so I think we have to at least start with the data. So, you, so I think the data should be look, disaggregated by, so collected by and then disaggregated by and examined by ethnicity. It can be by uh, income, mm. education, it can be by location, you know, rural, urban, or so by all of those things. If we think that there's some axis of inequity operating, then we need to look in our own patient practices yeah. For differences there, and even in differences in prescribing patterns, we have to be unafraid to shine that bright light of inquiry on our own practice. And then, you no, know, we're not doing an epidemiologic study, but it will inform us and it will inform our practice. And if we really care about all of our patients, we should want to know what those data will show us. We shouldn't cover over things. If we think that in the society in which we live right now, there are differences by these things, then we have to ask, how is that manifesting in my practice? Right. Very important. Yeah. And that was. That's, that's great to hear, there's, I mean, because we know from the evidence that there's gaps between Māori and non-Māori. Right. So, even if it's only my 20 patients, yes, I should you, still you know. look, at, look at that. And, and Absolutely. And then, it might be that from the ground up, from the GP practice up, there might be some insight on what to do. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of the things are going to be in terms of, you know, social investment and all like mm -hmm. that. But in the GP thing, if you, you look and you say, oh my God, I didn't realize that in my practice, this, then you could start thinking about I interventions or strategies at that individual level while you're also acknowledging that there are bigger forces that need to be addressed. Yeah. So I think there's power that it shouldn't be a scary thing or oh, now people are going to think I'm racist or oh, you know, they're going to think I'm a bad doctor. Or, there shouldn't be any of that. We should be fearless. We should be courageous in examining our own practice because it can only help our practice. And in fact, we have to be courageous in all of life. You know, I talked a little bit before about comfort. If we stay comfortable, we are not growing, we are dying. We mm. are turning into stone. We have to constantly push against the edge of our comfort. It's like going back to med school. Yeah. You're constantly out of your comfort zone. Yes, you're constantly, but you have to constantly be out of your comfort That's how you grow. Mm. Being out of your comfort zone might even be embracing challenges. Somebody says, will you do a video? Will you, you know, ask somebody, you know, questions on a video? And you're like, oh, I don't know, but oh, okay. And then now when you do that thing, you know more about your power. It might be, will you travel to New Zealand and do a keynote address at a thing? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then obviously they thought I could do it. So I do it. And now I know more about my power. So, you know, it's when we embrace challenge, when we push to the edge of our comfort and stay there, when we travel across town or across the country to a place that we don't know, and don't just visit and dip in, but we go and we stay there, speak to strangers, when, you know, that's how you build community. When we do those things at the edge of our comfort, we grow as human beings, we enlarge ourselves, and that's where we learn. So if it's a comfort thing, then that argument is completely off the, off the chart. Yeah, great. Oh, I think I could carry on and, and ask you so much, but I, I really want to thank you. And I think you know, uh, your insight from 19 years ago, you know, I think has allowed you to connect with the audience in your keynote today, and, and not, not to mention all your other work, and you would have anyway, but I think you know, having that connection to Aotearoa, to New Zealand, 
and um, I'm thankful for giving up more of your time to chat with me. And, oh, I'm um, delighted. I'm really happy to be here and it's mm -hmm. making, I'm understanding the strengths, the many strengths of this country, especially the strengths of Maori people, but the strengths of the whole nation, again, in a way that um, I missed so much when I left and I'm already feeling it again. So I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.